Great. Okay, so this one's a little shorter. Um, so parathyroids. So those four little, you know, pea-sized glands that are the, embedded in the back of the, th of the thyroid, um, those can get messed up too. It seems like everything can go awry somehow, right? Um, so we'll talk about the disorders of parathyroid glands, but mainly uh, under the umbrellas of talking about hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. So I don't want you to think that these are the only things that cause calcium disorders. Um, there are other issues that can, can cause the calcium to be out of whack, but we're going to mainly focus on how the parathyroid and the calcium interplay uh, today. So quick review, we just went through that. So moving on. Um, so what does the parathyroid glands do? They produce a parathyroid hormone, which then regulates serum calcium level in the same kind of feedback loop as the thyroid, just different players involved. Um, so as the, PT, or as the serum calcium goes up, the PTA should go down, right? And as the serum calcium goes down, the PTA should go up so that blood calcium is maintained at a normal level. That's its goal. That's, a, that's the end goal. So how does it do that though? How does the PTA maintain serum calcium? It regulates it by uh, having an effect on three different target organs. That's the bone, the intestines, and the kidney, okay? So when the, when the calcium is off, it'll, for example, if it's low, it'll take some from the bone. Um, or it'll encourage the uh, intestines to absorb more calcium through the effects of vitamin D. Or it'll tell the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium or let more go or so forth and so on. So you can kind of get the picture there. Um, let's see. So there is a kind of a cartoon depiction of the same thing I just said. Um, the kidney effect is kind of indirect because it makes vitamin D3, which helps with absorption. So um, that's one thing to note there. Um, so we'll start with hypercalcemia, with an emphasis on primary hyperparathyroidism. So causes of hypercalcemia are broad. You can look here. Oops. Um, but the most common cause is, is um, hyperparathyroidism, OK? Um, here, okay, sorry, I don't know why I switched over there. Uh, cancer is one, but that shouldn't be necessarily the first thing you think of. Um, there are other things. The first thing that comes to my mind when someone's calcium is elevated is what medications are they taking? Um, because uh, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, for example, is very commonly used and it causes the calcium to be out of whack. The other thing is you'll find that a lot of patients take Rolaids like they would take Tic Tacs, okay? So they just carry them around and just kind of pop them all the time. That can cause their calcium to be out of whack, so you need to ask questions about you know, what other over-the-counter medications are you taking as well, not just prescription. Um, the other thing is vitamin D therapy over the last decade has been much more you know, used and, and more popular. High doses of vitamin D are being used to normalize that. And it, it is possible to give too much vitamin D. It, it takes a lot, um, but it can cause high calcium as well. Uh, there's a, a variety of other things. Even just being immobile for a long time can cause high calcium. Um, being, uh, you know, there's renal failure, lots of different things. But again, primary hyperparathyroidism is what we're going to be going through here. And just as a side note, I think sarcoidosis is listed on about every <laughs> uh, Did you guys ever watch House? Yeah. Uh, maybe too, way too old to, but it was always kind of like the, you know, it ended up being the diagnosis I felt like a lot. Okay, so um, here we are, differential. Um, so intact PTH is a lab test that you can order, um, and it differentiates hyperparathyroidism-induced hypercalcemia from other forms, okay? So if the PTH is high, then that's not normal, right? The PTH should not be high in the presence of high calcium. So um, that's the cause. Something's wrong with the parathyroid glands. They shouldn't be doing that. If the PTH is suppressed, uh, you need to start thinking about other things that I listed there. Okay, so, wow. A Does this ever do this to you? It's just me. Sweaty hands, maybe. Okay, so. Um, all right, so this is a graph of what it should do. Um, the stars are what happens in hyperparathyroidism. So as the calcium, the ionized calcium goes up, you see like around 1.2 there, the intact PTA should go down, okay? So in kind of that fashion. Um, but with um, hyperparathyroidism, it continues going up for some reason, and we'll talk about why. Try this. Oh, wow. Sorry, okay. just using the mouse instead, baby. Okay. 
Okay, so etiology, uh, what causes this to happen? Um, usually, um, it's one kind of rogue parathyroid gland. It's on its own. It doesn't listen to the rules. Um, it's, it's doing its own thing. That's 80% of the time. Sometimes it's all of them working together in tandem to cause, cause uh, mayhem, right? Okay, so that's 15% of the time. The rest is, is kind of these weird uh, endocrinopathies, MEN1, MEN2. Um, to me, honestly, those are kind of hard to put my, wrap my mind around. They're rare, um, but that does happen, and they can, um, <coughs> it can be the cause. And, and there's some other familiar disorders of hypoparathyroidism that we'll talk briefly about. Um, so, signs and symptoms. Um, you think the mouse is the best? <laughs> or use the uh, keyboard, the little directional arrows. Yeah, okay. Okay, so signs and symptoms. Uh, there's, you know, I always remember in school, the stones, bones, groans, and bones. It, it, you know, it rhymes, but really it's not that helpful, I don't think. Um, it kind of is, I guess. Um, but it's, it's catchy, right? But most of the time people are asymptomatic. So uh, for the most part, this is just going to come up when, you know, they're doing labs for something else and you see that their calcium is out of whack and you go down this rabbit trail of trying to figure out what's wrong. Um, but if people don't have much access to medical care, um, for whatever reason, um, they may come in um, with these symptoms and you have to figure it out. Um, but it can cause long-standing um, high, you know, high calcium, definitely can, can predispose people to kidney stones and that should be looked into no matter, what. if someone has kidney stones, and they're having them, you know, over and over, you should be considering this. Uh, there's a variety of bone issues that can occur with hypercalcemia, uh, um, abdominal issues as well, pancreatitis, although it's more common with alcohol and with triglyceride levels, but it can be a presenting symptom. And then as it gets really bad, you start to see some of these other issues like personality changes. I've honestly never encountered that, but apparently it can get that bad where people have... Um, even a coma from high calcium. So stones, let's see, here we go. So kidney stones occur in less than 15% of the cases. They're usually calcium oxalate, um, which makes sense. Um, there, the other thing though, besides just stones, there's just kind of a gradual dysfunction that happens to the kidneys with high calcium. It takes time, so you may not notice it right, you know, you don't notice it right away. They may have good kidney function at first, but if something's not done, this does do, do harm to the kidneys. Bone. Oh, wow. Bones. Um, when I was looking at the research on this, it's really rare to see like osteitis fibrosa anymore. It just it doesn't go that long. Usually, people are treated or caught before then, but it, it can happen. Um, there can be bone pain or fractures from high calcium levels, which almost seems like a backwards thing to think about. You think, oh, I have too much calcium, and my bones are brittle. You have to think about osteoporosis as a, it needs to be in, in a certain structure. The osteoblast and osteoclast need to be in a tandem, a perfect little um, uh, conjunction with each other to form a good matrix, okay? And the architecture of the bone matrix is so important because if you have too much calcium or too little calcium, that is disrupted, and so that makes bones brittle. So both high calcium and low calcium can affect bone structure. Um, let's see. Okay, so other labs um, that are often ordered besides just, you know, the calcium obviously that, that told you something was wrong and then the intact PTH that you want to look at. Um, you know, you can look at a 24-hour urine collection for calcium and creatinine. This will help you distinguish a primary hyperparathyroidism from an uncommon disorder called benign familial hypercalcemic hypocalciuria. <laughs> Um, so you want to rule out that, um, and it shows you here that it, it's usually high in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, over 400 in 24 hours, and lower normal in the familiar disorder. You also want to be ordering a bone density scan on patients with hypercalcemia to look for osteoporosis, um, and then just a complete metabolic panel to uh, look at kidney function, uh, liver function. Alphos, remember that's that lab I told you about in the thyroid that is often elevated with bone turnover. Um, so that becomes very important in, in this patient population. And vitamin D is crucial to know too. What's the level of the vitamin D? Because if it's just a matter of not having a, you know, too much vitamin D, or in the case of hypocalcemia, not enough, that's an easier fix. So treatment. Um, definitive treatment for primary hyperparathyroidism is a parathyroidectomy. 
okay? Most people end up there um, if they're surgical candidates, okay? It's, it's kind of tricky to, there's not a great, at least that I'm aware of, and um, maybe Dr. Latassi can help me with this, um, um, but I, when I was more treating this, because I haven't been um, in practice, I've been working at a good shepherd, but not seeing as much parathyroid patients, there weren't, wasn't like a medication that just fixed this. Um, they had some stuff in trials, uh, teraparit or teraparitide with hypocalcemia, but there wasn't anything else for um, hypercalcemia due to uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. So surgery was pretty much the end game. Um, usually use a parathyroid cestamibi scan to localize uh, which parathyroid gland is, is, is causing the problem, and then that one is removed, okay? Um, if it's hyperplasia, like I talked about, and like the 15%, I think, uh, of the population that has this, then often they'll move three and a half glands, okay? So that doesn't seem super scientific in some ways, but I guess that's so. Um, the cure rate is really pretty good with a good surgeon. So 95% with an experienced surgeon, um, but no good medical therapy. This is important, though, is if people are awaiting surgery, they need to make sure that they're well hydrated, and that helps protect their kidney function. These people tend to get really dehydrated quickly, so water uh, intake is always stressed um, in clinic. So who should have surgery? This ends up being most people. Um, I feel like it's kind of not super helpful. <laughs> uh, basically, if they're a good surgical candidate, um, under 50 for sure, because it doesn't go away. It's not going to get better. So they're just going to have uh, more and more effect to their kidneys and more and more effect to their bones. So you just need to have it taken care of. Now, if someone's like 80 years old, you know, maybe <laughs> it's not you know worth it to go through all that. Uh, that sounds terrible. I don't mean that <laughs> meanly, but. If they don't have a long life expectancy, then possibly a surgery is not, is not necessary. Um, but it can affect, like I said, the kidney function. A 30% decrease in renal function makes someone a, a great candidate. You need to go ahead and take care of it, okay? Or if they have signs of osteoporosis, it kind of pushes that surgery up a little bit, like it needs to be done sooner. Um, so consequences, ongoing bone loss, uh, kidney stones, uh, kidney dysfunction. Also cardiovascular complications with hypercalcemia, LVH and congestive heart failure are not uncommon in this scenario. So um, ACE put out a statement uh, a while back and basically said that if anyone had a reasonable life expectancy and suitable operative and anesthesia risk factors, they need to have surgery. Okay? So that kind of makes it, I think, pretty simple. Most people have surgery. Okay. So that's hyper. Calcemia with primary hyperparathyroidism and emphasis. We're moving on to hypocalcemia, but does anyone have questions before we go? Sorry about this, guys. Okay, so hypocalcemia, again, focusing just on how kind of the parathyroid glands interplay with that. Um, and there's something called pseudo hypoparathyroidism that we'll talk about briefly. It's more of a resistance to parathyroid action rather than um, a primary issue with function, okay? So we'll. So, signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. This is across the board, not just for uh, high, uh, the uh, parathyroid's role. This is just if someone has low calcium, whatever the cause. Um, tetany is the hallmark sign, but that's, severe, that's usually when it's severe, okay? When calcium is quite low, um, there can be carpal spasms. Um, this, you probably read about this, I don't know if you say it, Chabot sticks, do you know how you say it, anybody? Okay. But it's, have, you, have you guys gone through that when you tap right here and it causes a contraction, a hemi-contraction of the, of the face? That's with low calcium. You tap on the facial nerve. It's something you can do in a physical exam to see if someone has low calcium. Um, also, Trousseau's sign is with the blood pressure cuff inflated 20 over the systolic pressure for three minutes. You leave it on and it usually results in a carpal spasm. So that's, that, those are ways from a physical exam standpoint to um, look at the severity of, of hypocalcemia. Oh, patients will talk about numbness around their mouth. That's one of the number one signs I've seen um, in this. So the patient population you see this in is uh, surgical patients from a thyroid. Like they come back after having a thyroidectomy and they'll be like, man, my, my face is tingly. My lips feel numb. And uh, you should be thinking, uh oh, <laughs> so they've got low calcium. Okay, so true versus factitious hypocalcemia. This is really important. Um, albumin can falsely lower serum calcium levels. And so when you get a CMP back, a complete metabolic panel, 
Um, you need to investigate the calcium further if it's low by looking at the albumin. Um, uh, especially in my patient population um, that I have so many diabetics. Um, diabetics lose a ton of protein in the urine, right? That's one of you know the early markers is the albumin to creatinine ratio that starts to be increased in diabetics. Um, as you lose protein in the urine, your serum albumin goes down and it messes up your calcium level fictitiously just from the blood work. So you have to correct it. Um, so there's a, there's a calculation you use here, but you add 0.8 to the total serum calcium for each one that the albumin is less than four. So there's a little practice calculation, but you can look like a superstar when you're on rotations and say it's actually not real low calcium, it's just a fictitious, you know. <laughs> there, you'll look really smart. Um, let's see. So manifestations of chronic hypocalcemia, not just the acute side, which we talked about can be more dangerous, but just kind of a low lying, uh, low calcium, not super severe, but just not in the right spot can affect the heart the bones, the eyes, the skin, the teeth. Um, so it seems like it's not that big of a deal, but over time it can really add up. Um, it can cause prolongation of QT, T wave inversions, again, osteoporosis, increased risk of fractures. Um, I, I didn't realize this until doing more, but there are higher risk of cataracts uh, with low calcium. Um, it's a severe, you can have a seizure. So there are a lot of different things that can happen uh, with low calcium. So, uh, what are the causes of low calcium? Uh, primary hypoparathyroidism, which is what most of this is on, um, is, is one of the number one causes, and it's mainly because of surgery, okay? So, that's where you typically see it, is the surgery kind of gone bad, okay? Um, but uh, there's also an autoimmune form, which gets quite confusing, they're rare, um, and there, I didn't touch anything, did you guys see that? <laughs> okay. Uh, post-radiation, infiltrative, uh, there's other things, metal depositions that can affect the parathyroid gland, um, but most of the time it's surgery, okay, they've been um, damaged during surgery. A resistance to PTH action, um, we're going to talk about pseudo-hypoparathyroidism here, that's when the PTH is being produced, but it's not working on the end organs, okay. Uh, but there are other reasons for low calcium. We talked about vitamin D e deficiency, et cetera. Um, this. So the main reason for this uh, slide is just to show you that when you have low calcium, you also need to consider magnesium. Um, you need to rule out that it's just not a magnesium issue and treat that. You also need to measure vitamin D as well as PTH. So hallmarks of primary hypoparathyroidism, low calcium, high phosphate, and a low or undetectable PTH. Does that all make sense? Why that would be? Okay. Remember the, the high phosphate because that actually helps you distinguish it from some other types later on. So surgical hypoparathyroidism, um, um, transient hypocalcemia is fairly common after thyroidectomy. Okay, Up to 50% of patients after having a thyroidectomy will have some period of time where they struggle with their calcium. Okay, That's pretty common. Um, but usually, within a few weeks to a month, that should start to normalize. When you start to get nervous is when people still have low calcium and they're, you know, six months out. That's when you're dealing with more of a permanent issue that is going to require lifelong calcium um, treatment. So um, this is important to, uh, you know, permanent hypocalcemia is between 0.5 to 6.6% um, follow, you know, following surgery. So uh, thyroidectomy. So it's very important that that difference in that range has to do with surgical skill. So the, the importance in finding a good head and neck surgeon is crucial. Um, I, again, like I said, probably not many general surgeons. I mean, I'm not, but I would think that you want to make sure that they do a lot of thyroidectomies before you recommend surgery there. There is a syndrome called hungry bone syndrome that I wanted to at least touch on um, that can happen post-op. When someone has severe hyperparathyroidism and then they go in for surgery, um, the bones have gone through such a period of being depleted um, because the serum calcium is so high, the bones are starved of calcium that after surgery, there can be a huge shift um, of time where the bones suck up everything that they're getting. And even with a, a good surgery, they take a time to recover. And so that's important that it didn't necessarily mean that surgery didn't work, it could just be that the bones are really still recouping from that time frame of not having adequate calcium. 
Um, you distinguish it from surgical hypoparathyroidism by the phosphorus level, okay? So it's low in hungry bones and high in hypoparathyroidism, okay? And there can also be a lot of pain involved with this just because of this, the skeletal issues there. Um, autoimmune hypoparathyroidism, so again, this isn't as common but can happen. Uh, it's often in the groupings of other endocrinopathies, um, but it usually happens earlier on in life. This isn't typically you see something for the first time in someone's 40 or 50. Um, this is something that they usually get when they're um, less than 10. So oftentimes they will come to you already with this diagnosed if you're not in the pediatric population. So, other causes of primary hypoparathyroidism. These are kind of, this slide is more about like metal depositions. So. Um, with DeGeorge, I think that's how you say it, syndrome, one of the possibilities is that also the parathyroid glands are affected because of iron deposition. Um, and then with Wilson's disease, you know, is, is with copper. And so that can uh, deposit around the parathyroid glands and, and inhibit their function. Um, also, in the past with dialysis, they used to use aluminum binders more often, and that used to mess up parathyroid gland function, but that's kind of been, that's been changed, so that's more rare. Um, magnesium depletion um, can paralyze parathyroid glands um, and uh, cause issues there too. Um, so other things to keep in mind, especially with alcoholism and the magnesium deficiencies, sometimes just correcting that, you know, corrects the, the hypocalcemia. Okay, um, going on to pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, which is the last part, we're so close. Um, questions before we finish up? Okay. So remember, this is a matter of resistance to PTH action. So the PTH is working, um, it's responding like it's supposed to, but no matter how much it's there, it's not getting to where, it's not getting into the system to, to let the bones work the way they should in the intestines to normalize serocalcium. Um, so it's an inherited disorder of target organ unresponsiveness to parathyroid hormone. Usually it, it starts early on in life, um, around eight. Um, it has no response to infused parathyroid hormones. So you can give them all you want, it doesn't matter, it doesn't work. Um, they have low calcium, they have a high PTH, and they have high phosphate, okay? There's, there's three different types, but there's kind of four, um, and it's confusing, so I'm sorry, the, the slide's maybe not the best way to explain it, but the fourth type is called pseudo-pseudo, and I think if you call anything pseudo-pseudo, <laughs> you don't really know. <laughs> well, I don't, it transcends classification, so, um, We'll talk about that at the end, but that's actually the name of it is pseudo-pseudo hypoparathyroidism. But the three different types mainly uh, that we'll, we'll go through here first at least is type 1A, 1B, and 2. Um, what differentiates them is this uh, test. It's a urinary cyclic AMP test. It, and you measure it in response to administration of PTH. Okay, so you want to see uh, does it show a difference. And, um, if it's blunted, it kind of different, differentiates these types. So type 1A is called Albright's. It's a hereditary osteodystrophy. I have a picture of kind of the phenotype, what it looks like, uh, at least the characteristic of the hands that can happen. Um, and it is autosomal dominant. Um, type 1B, the resistance to the PTH is only in the kidneys, which is interesting. So it works elsewhere, bones, but not in the kidneys. Um, but it's very similar to type 1A, thus, hence it's, you know, 1B, 1A. Uh, it's poorly understood, uh, it doesn't have the physical features of Albright's, okay? Um, but for both 1A and 1B, you have this, this urinary cyclic AMP test that kind of differenti differentiates them. Type 2 um, ha is similar to 1, but the physical characteristics of Albright's are absent, okay? So it kind of has the clinic or the, the um, lab picture of type 1, but not the phenotype picture of type 1A. Okay? Um, and so there's pseudo-pseudo, see, it does exist, the pseudo-pseudo uh, PPHP has the physical features, but everything else is normal, isn't that weird? So the calcium is okay, the PTH is okay, all those things are fine, the urinary cyclic AMP test is fine, but you have the phenotyp phenotypical picture of Albright's. So those are the types <coughs> of pseudo-hyperparathyroidism. That's Albright's, Albright's uh, hereditary osteodystrophy. Those are the, the picture of what can happen to the knuckles. There's a dimple instead of a knuckle there. You also have short stature, round face, short neck. Um, so let's see here. So that's 1A, and then the pseudo-pseudo has that, okay? 
Now, how to manage low calcium, this is just the management part, a few different slides on acute and chronic, you need to separate the two, there's a whole different um, picture. Uh, acute treatment of hypocalcemia can be quite delicate and dangerous, um, and it needs to be with a lot of supportive treatment around. It is not something you just do in a regular clinic. You want to have, you know, access to EKG, airway protection, a lot of things on hand, because when you administrate um, calcium, uh, not only does it irritate the veins, but it can also cause some other issues with uh, heart function and so forth. So it's a pretty, it can be uh, pretty dangerous. But if tetany exists, you have to treat um, hypocalcemia with IV calcium. <coughs> Chronic hypocalcemia is a different thing. Um, so the goal is to try to get it between 8.5 and, and 9.2. If it's too low, you can get cataracts. If it's too high, you can have a chance of kidney stones and chronic renal insufficiency. So you've got to try to get to that uh, range. Uh, also, you have to have calcium and vit vitamin D along with the calcium to treat it. Um, usually you give somewhere between um, like four grams of calcium a day, divided up um, every six hours or so. You can use calcium citrate, calcium carbonate. Um, citrate, I believe, uh, doesn't have to be given with food, um, whereas carbonate does. Uh, you also need to do vitamin D, long-acting and short-acting. There's something called rocaltrol, which is a short-acting vitamin D preparation, and then vitamin D 25 um, there's a preparation that you can give in the 50,000 unit range to treat uh, uh, that side of the vitamin D, the long-acting side. Um, hyperphosphatemia can also occur, as we talked about, and the important thing there is to talk about patients with their diet because they can add phosphate to their diet in certain foods, so they need to limit meat, eggs, and dairy products, but sometimes that's not even enough. They have to use binders, phosphate binders, to keep the phosphate under control. Um, and, and it's kind of a catch point too because the vitamin D that you're giving to treat that can also increase the absorption of phosphorus, so that elevates phosphorus as well. So, but you have to kind of do that. Um, so, anyways, that's a treatment of chronic uh, hypocalcemia. I put down here a little graph for how often to monitor what. Um, uh, PTH replacement, and again, this may have changed, so I apologize. This is a slightly old presentation, but. Um, Forteo used to be out as kind of an off-label uh, use uh, for treating um, hypocalcemia in this, at these forms, but it wasn't approved for that. Do you know if that's different now, Dr. Lucassi? I, I don't. Okay. I don't know about the off-label. I don't. Okay. And then they had a new one that they were kind of, you know, researching. It's called uh, PTH-184 that possibly would be used in, in these uh, scenarios. But there wasn't a great um, other treatment besides just calcium, vitamin D, and maintaining the, all the other supporting cast. So, a um, couple of questions before we finish up here. Um, which of the following patients has laboratory evidence consistent with hypoparathyroidism? found this from one of those test book questions, so I thought it would be fun to go through. Any thoughts? It's a little tricky. The one thing you want to think of is if it's not, it's not magnesium that's causing it, right? You want to rule that out. So that kind of helps eliminate a couple. A is the correct answer. Um, so low calcium, high phosphate, and normal magnesium. So that, that, that points more to hypoparathyroidism and not a magnesium deficiency. Um, so there's that one. And then I think the last one, I believe, permanent postoperative hypoparathyroidism is estimated to develop in what percentage of patients after thyroidectomy? It's B. So 0.5 to 6.6, .6. and that's just a good discussion to have with someone that want, needs to have a thyroidectomy. You have a decent chance <laughs> of having post-operative, you know, hypoparathyroidism. Again, surgical skill is kind of the difference between the 0.5 and the 6.6. .6. Okay, oh, one more. Long-term complications of hypoparathyroidism include what? Yeah, don't you love the all of the above? <laughs> yeah. D. Okay, I think that's it. Does anyone have questions? I kind of flew through the last one, but uh, there's a little less to kind of manage there than the thyroid. Well, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. So